Okay, we're going to talk about ultrasound of the lung for pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and pleural effusion. This is a very typical case. A 56-year-old guy comes in. He's got a 60-pack year history of smoking, known left ventricular ejection fraction of only 35%, and now he's got a shortness of breath. So here's this guy with COPD and CHF, and you're trying to figure out why he's short of breath, and do you give him steroids and albuterol, or are you going to treat him with diuretics? And then you do an ultrasound of his chest, and you see he's got either B lines for pulmonary edema, or he's got A lines, which is consistent with COPD. So this is something that ultrasound really helps me right there at the point of care. I don't have to wait for uh, a test, another test to do it. I just know the diagnosis immediately. Ultrasound's super fun here because I get to use all three probes when I'm looking at the lung. I use this probe for looking at pneumonias and pulmonary edema and pleural effusions, basically everything with this probe. And then pneumothorax is really with this probe. You wouldn't want to use this probe for a pneumo. And then this probe here, it's so pretty. It makes so many nice images. I love to use it whenever I can get away with it. And once in a while, you get some pretty nice images of a, of a pneumonia or pleural effusion here with this transducer as well. So where are we going to look in the body? We're going to look uh, anteriorly and posteriorly. Anteriorly is where we look for pneumothorax. Posteriorly is where we look for pneumonia. And then in all these quadrants, we're going to be looking for pulmonary edema. Uh, and so B lines, you can see them bilaterally in all the quadrants. So it all depends on where you're going to put the probe. But if you add up one, two, three, four, plus the other side of the chest, bring down the five, carry the one, you get to about eight probe positions on both sides of the body. Now, when the sound goes into uh, the body, what happens is it encounters the pleural line. The pleural line is where the visceral and the parietal pleura come together. And what happens is when sound encounters that uh, air interface there between the chest wall and the lung up against the chest wall, the, um, the sound scatters around a little bit. And what happens is you get this reverberation artifact where you have these equidistant lines called A lines that make their way down into the chest. If I increased my depth and bumped up my far field gain, I'd probably see a third A line down here. But they are equidistant from the skin line into the pleural line. You get these repeating A lines. That's pretty normal. We see that in hopefully everybody listening to this podcast. But if you have COPD, you can also have A lines. And frankly, if you have a pulmonary embolism, you can also have A lines too. So other th conditions that cause dyspnea can result in A lines. However, when you have air that gets replaced by something else, you lose your A-lines. So if air gets replaced by blood or edema or infection or contusions or tumors, then that's going to enable the sound to then become transmittable through that substance. See, sound will travel through all these things, but it does not like to travel through air. And so you lose your A-line when you have some pathology going on. In particularly, you can have B-lines. B-lines is when you have an uh, alveolar interstitial syndrome or water inside uh, the lung where sound encounters that air fluid interface and has a really cool uh, artifactual thing called a beeline. These are comet tails that extend to the bottom of the screen, aka lung rockets. Now in some patients you'll see the occasional beeline rocking back and forth, but you don't want to see multiple beelines. When you see multiple beelines, you want to think about a loop diuretic such as furosemide. And to talk a little bit more about where the lung, uh, if you really want to blow up these uh, interlobular septae here, you can think about fluid being in the interlobular septae, and then the sound transmits uh, through that interlobular septae, interacts with that air fluid interface, and then that's what creates the B line. And you can see these B lines here, multiple B lines coming down on this patient's, uh, from this patient's pleural line. We have loss of the A lines. Over here, uh, this is something uh, called a chest x-ray. This is an, in the olden days, we used to get these uh, to look for something called curly B lines. I'm not even sure if I spelled that right. Uh, I tried to Google it, it didn't come up anywhere. But these are curly B lines here. They came off the edges of the chest wall back in our, when our forefathers looked at pulmonary uh, edema. This is what they did. Um, but now we just use ultrasound because it's so much more accurate. Here's these uh, B lines coming down to the bottom of the screen here. Uh, you can see very nice lung rockets going on here in this patient with pulmonary edema. Very easy to see. There's a recent study uh, done in Turkey where nurses were doing ultrasound for B lines out in the uh, waiting room and finding all these patients who uh, needed some Lasix. Uh, very easy to see these lung rockets coming down to the bottom of the screen. You can see over here these nice uh, B lines rocking back and forth over here, whereas over here, this patient has just equidistant A-lines that are coming down from that uh, 
the chest wall. So that's enough about pulmonary edema. Let's talk about pneumothorax. It's one of my favorite topics. You get these trauma patients coming in and their lungs collapse and you want to find out right away. The way you do it is with a linear transducer, high frequency linear transducer. You're going to place it in multiple intercostal spaces on that anterior chest wall in that sagittal orientation. What that means is the indicator is up towards the patient's head so that the sound is going to get bumped by these ribs right here and you're going to see these ribs as uh, your landmarks, your, your um, your rib shadows in order to find the pleural line using the linear transducer. A patient's going to breathe in and out four or five times and you're going to move the probe around the chest looking for lung sliding. Well, what do I mean by that? Wherever the visceral pleura of the lung comes up to the parietal pleura of the chest wall, that's called the pleural interface. And as the patient breathes in and out, you'll see the pleural interface rock back and forth there on ultrasound. This is not ultrasound, this is a CT scan, but it's trying to get at the point that when um, air that's inside the lung parenchyma here, that impairs the transmission of ultrasound. So when the lung is up against the chest wall, you should be able to see the visceral uh, pleura of the lung sliding up against the parietal pleura of the chest wall. And when those two things slide back and forth, the lung is up, there's no air between them, there's no pneumothorax. Now, when there is a pneumothorax, that lung falls away from the chest wall, and now the sound can no longer see the sliding of the lung because there's air in this interface. And so now you just have this weird artifact that comes down without the lung sliding, as you're about to see. So the absence of lung sliding is the pneumothorax. Now, as you move on and look at these images, I want you to pay attention to the rib shadows. The rib shadows, because the probe is in a sagittal plane with the indicator towards the head, this is, I don't know, rib number four, and then this down here is rib number five. And between those two rib shadows, we see the lung sliding, the, the visceral parietal pleural interface, the VPPI, sliding back and forth against one another. This patient does not have a pneumothorax because we see those little comet tails sliding back and forth here where, those, where that interface is. However, on this next patient, we definitely see the rib shadows with the corresponding uh, shadows there. And in between those ribs and the shadows, we see the VP... Oh, wait a minute. I don't even see the visceral uh, pleura. All I see is the um, parietal pleura. All the stuff down here is just all artifact, you guys. That's not actual stuff. That's just artifact. Sounds coming in through skin, fat, muscle, encounters the parietal pleura, and can't go any further. Okay, it's stuck right here. This is just artifact. But notice there's no lung sliding because the visceral pleura is not up against the chest wall. So therefore, this patient has a pneumothorax. Let's look at some more of these, and you'll feel more comfortable with it. It looks a little weird right now, but you're going to feel more comfortable. Before we get there, though, I want to go back to this diagram. This person right here, Maria Menike, did a really cool study looking for uh, the, how where the distribution of traumatic pneumothoraces are inside the chest. And she didn't use ultrasound, though. She used CT scans. She took a whole bunch of CT scans, which are amazing for pneumothorax, and she found out that the places they hide out or the places where you're going to have an occult very small pneumothorax, we use that term in medicine a lot, occult, it means hard to find, easily missed, is going to be in this area right here, this anterior uh, chest wall between the fifth and eighth intercostal space. Don't pay attention to these numbers. She like randomly numbered all these parts of the chest wall, but it's the, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, something like that. This area around here is where you want to look. I tend to go maybe a little bit too high, but you want to come down that uh, anterior fifth and eighth intercostal space is where you're going to look for those pneumothoraces. So you want to be able to come down, maybe even down through here a little bit. I should have drawn that yellow thing down here some more, but you get the idea. That's where she found them all on the CT scans. Now, she's a really interesting person. She lives in Germany, and she came out and did some training with some of my friends on the on the East Coast at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, with Dr. Platts. And uh, while she was out here, she was at the Boston Marathon, and somebody collapsed dead at the Boston Marathon, and it was right next to her, so she ran over there, and she did CPR on the guy, 62 years old, boom, the guy survives. And the whole city was, like, so excited about her that um, the city uh, honored her at the Boston Celtics game, uh, like, the next night, and there she is. That's the author of the study, uh, Maria Menike there at the, uh, being uh, properly honored there by the players from the Celtics and the Cleveland Cavaliers after she successfully resuscitated a, a runner in the Boston Marathon. Good on you there, Maria. So looking at these uh, pneumothoraces, what do you see here? Which patient's got the pneumothorax? Can you tell? That's right, the patient over here on the left. So here's a rib, and here's a rib and a shadow, and this is the where we're looking for lung sliding. We don't see it there. This is just an artifact down here. This patient's got a pneumo, whereas this patient, there's good lung sliding. 
How about these guys here? Good lung sliding over here, right? I see the rib shadow, rib shadow. We're cool there. Rib shadow, rib shadow. What's going on here? This is all artifact. No lung sliding here. The sound came in and then just jammed right back and caused all this uh, artifact down here. And so there's no lung sliding. So that is a pneumothorax. Another example over here. What about this? Oh, no, I see some lung sliding there. What about over here? Rib shadow, rib shadow. Yeah, this looks like a pneumo here. It's not sliding back and forth. I don't see those ants marching back and forth. That's a pneumothorax. What about these guys here? Well, there's definitely lung sliding over here. Uh, we definitely see that uh, lung, there's a rib shadow. Over here, though, rib shadow, rib shadow. I don't see the lung sliding. This looks like a, oh, wait a minute. No, now it is sliding. Wait, now it's not. Oh, so it's not. So that must be a pneumo, right? Oh, nope, sliding now. So what's happening is this patient's holding their breath and mimicking a pneumothorax. Sometimes patients will have fun with you that way, but um, you definitely want to make sure they take, you know, big deep breaths, four or five respiratory cycles, so you don't inadvertently put a chest tube in somebody. What's going on in this video, though? You can see the rib shadow here, rib shadow here, and then here we see some sliding. Right there is good sliding, but over here there's no sliding. We call that the lung point. It's the transition zone between no pneumothorax and pneumothorax. Let me show you what I mean with a CT scan. So here's this massive pneumothorax. The, all the black stuff here is air on a CT scan. This lung is squished all the way, you know, posteriorly. In fact, this is one of those CT scans that you never want to see. This is like somebody screwed up because they should have been able to pick this up even like with a stethoscope. This is a big pneumo. But anyways, it's the transition zone I wanted to point out to you over here. This is the area between where there's no pneumothorax and when there is pneumothorax up here. No pneumo, pneumo. Why is the pneumothorax dangerous anyways? Well, if this pneumothorax gets bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually it's going to squish the heart all the way over to the right side, right into the right chest, when what that's going to cause is the heart's going to get pinched off from its blood supply, and it's going to get obstructed, and then you're going to die. <laughs> and so, uh, so pneumothorax, once it squishes everything off to the other side, we call that a tension pneumothorax, and it is lethal. And so that's why I want to be able to pick these things up. But I just want to point out that transition zone to you here. Another example of a transition zone going on here, we see that transition zone, no pneumo here, pneumo here, that's that transition zone lung point. Over here, we see good sliding all the way across. A couple more transition zones. I love these transition zones. So pneumo over here, and no pneumo here. Over here, we see no pneumo lung sliding, and then right here, I don't see any lung sliding. That's a pneumo. All right, um, we're going to, um, I just want to remind you about what it means to have um, some conditions in which you wouldn't want to put a chest tube in somebody accidentally. So uh, if somebody has a pleural effusion, you're not going to see a lot of lung sliding because the effusion is going to push the lung away from the chest wall. That fluid can give you a false sense that you see a pneumothorax because you're not seeing lung sliding. But if you put a chest tube in somebody with a pleural effusion, probably wouldn't that be that big of a deal. Um, you're going to probably want to get that fluid out of there anyways. They probably don't need a huge chest tube, but at the same time, it wouldn't be the end of the world. However, if you put a chest tube in somebody with pneumonia, that would be... Uh, a pretty bad move. Uh, so you want to avoid doing that because the reason you could mistake up this is that when the pneumonia gets pretty bad, it gets pretty sticky. And the pneumonia can do that. These pleural adhesions is when it sticks up against the chest wall and then the lung doesn't slide anymore because of that infected part of the lung just got all sticky, ended up getting the side of the wall there. And when the patient's breathing out, it doesn't move anymore. And so you go, oh, there's a pneumonia. You put a chest tube inside some pneumonia. Bad move, big time. Um, if somebody has a chest tube in place already, the area around the chest tube uh, may not slide very well. And then in somebody who has COPD, talk about somebody you do not want to do a chest tube in. They could have big, large blebs that aren't sliding, um, and you put a chest tube in it, that could cause a lot of damage to somebody who's already got very compromised lung function. So um, do you know? think about it in a clinical context. If somebody's really sick with pneumonia, why would they have a pneumothorax? If somebody's got severe COPD, where you really can't even hear the lung sounds to begin with, um, you want to think very carefully about uh, diagnosing them with a the pneumothorax. But that guy that falls off a motorcycle who is young and healthy should definitely have plenty of lung sliding, and you shouldn't worry about any of these um, things in somebody who's young and healthy. So we're going to switch now and talk more about pleural effusions. Pleural effusions kind of like a pneumothorax, but instead of having air between the chest, 
wall and the lung, you've got fluid between the chest wall and the lung. And the fluid's very dependent. The patient can sit up. It's going to flow all the way down here. If they lay flat, it's going to go more posterior. Chest x-rays uh, are not that good at finding pleural effusions. You need at least 300 cc's, whereas ultrasound, you only need about 50 cc's, and you can tell what kind of fusion it is. Um, this is the large footprint curvilinear transducer. Picked up a beautiful pleural effusion here. And what we're seeing here is the spine shadows coming up into the chest. It's a thoracic spine. As you go up into the chest, that confirms I'm definitely looking at pleural effusion, this anechoic area here. I've got the probe in a coronal plane with the indicator towards the patient's head. And you can see this pleural effusion down here squishing the lung away. Uh, and it's a coronal view like you do in Morrison's pouch. You're going to take that probe, you're going to place it between the ribs, 10th, 11th rib or so, indicated towards the patient's head, and you'll see where the diaphragm is and where that deep sulcus of the lung, uh, the pleural area, comes down in that deep cavity there. And this is where the fluid starts to accumulate. So when you see fluid on the other side of the diaphragm, uh, that's what a pleural effusion um, looks like. And you can slide between these ribs and confirm that you're looking at a pleural effusion. In this case, uh, we've got somebody who's got fluid on both sides of the diaphragm. This is somebody who's got um, very poor liver function, low albumin, and they get these, um, these bad pleural effusions. You can see it, um, transitative pleural effusion here coming out. Um, well, this is ascites right here on this side of the diaphragm, and then on this side of the diaphragm, up into the chest, we see that uh, transitive pleural effusion going on up here. So pleural effusion on both sides of the diaphragm in this case, I should say pleural effusion on this side of the diaphragm and ascites on this side of the diaphragm, fluid on both sides of the diaphragm from the same process. Um, I don't know about you, when I see this image, I don't know what it is, but it makes me want to grab my surfboard and head to the beach because when I see... I don't know what, it's weird, it's like there's something like the ultrasound machine is trying to talk, talk me, to trying to talk to me, or maybe there's uh, something going on um, with some direct-to-consumer uh, advertising, and I'm almost starting to hallucinate certain things on some of these ultrasounds, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but um, definitely when you've got somebody with a, uh, with a pleural effusion, you can see these kinds of uh, pictures sometimes. Mirror image artifact, the sound comes out of the probe into the liver, encounters the diaphragm. In normal individuals, it can't jump the diaphragm into the chest, and so it kind of rolls along the diaphragm, comes over here, messes around for a while, and then makes its way back to the probe. And the machine mistakens that as there being something further afield because it took longer for that sound to come back to the probe, so it accidentally sticks liver up in the chest because the material that the sound was kind of rolling around in before it made its way back to the probe was, after all, the liver. Or on the left side of this patient, it could be the spleen that you see up in the chest. So this is nice because everybody who's listening to this podcast, I hope you have a good mirror image artifact because that means there's no fluid up in your chest. This is a dry chest when you see the mirror image artifact as opposed to these patients here who do have fluid uh, up in their chest. You see the fluid writing itself right here above the diaphragm, and then you see the fluid down here. You see a nice spine sign as well down here. When the, when the fluid goes along that posterior chest wall, you can see the thoracic vertebral shadows going up into the chest, and this is just a normal uh, reflection there of the liver. One of the other nice things about ultrasound is that I can differentiate between a transudative and an exudative effusion. So a transudative effusion is very common with heart failure and cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome, and it's uh, usually from a low albumin state. Uh, we see it relatively commonly. They come in, they're very short of breath because this area in the chest fills up so much that we need to put a needle into it and drain it out therapeutically to give this some relief. Over here, though, you see an exudative effusion. This is common with uh, certain types of malignancies, and uh, I really think about, there's a whole laundry list of things you can see here, but I always think about infection here. So somebody could have, like in this patient here, he had a really bad pneumonia, um, and it went untreated. And uh, finally, he came in and sought care, but by then, this pneumonia had gotten so bad uh, that there, there was a big uh, infectious process, a big empyema that resulted. So we, when we did a diagnostic tap here, uh, as opposed to the therapeutic thoracentesis we did on that other patient, the diagnostic thoracentesis we did here, we saw all this pus come out with very high uh, white blood cell rate and stuff, and uh, this patient was pretty toxic appearing when we saw them. So this has uh, got all these echoes in there from all that um, debris and um, exudates. Uh, th but this could also look like um, a patient who maybe had a bad uh, motorcycle crash a week ago, and which, which was once a big hemothorax turned into a big 
um, when the blood sort of congealed and crashed out of solution, became a co uh, coagulated gelatinous matrix, it starts to look like this a little bit, a lot more isochoic with the organ next to it, like the liver or the spleen. So that's where ultrasound can be helpful in differentiating the different types of effusions. Now, when you want to drain somebody's effusion, what you want to do is you want to have them uh, sort of sit up and lean forward a little bit, and you want to you want to find a good spot with ultrasound where you're not going to inadvertently do biopsies of these organs down here. So you see a nice anechoic area that is the effusion. You know, the lung is all collapsed down here out of the way, and you're going to put the needle in just right along. You can use ultrasound guidance as you go in, uh, but it's probably not necessary. Just kind of mark, mark the back and then move in. Um, this is a uh, physical exam for pneumonia. So we're going to switch from talking about uh, pleural effusion to talk about pneumonia. And this is the last topic we're going to cover in this, in this podcast. So when you diagnose somebody with pneumonia, there's a few ways you can do it. And you always want to use the best of your ability to help your patients, right? So um, even in the best of hands, uh, the physical exam diagnostic, clinical diagnosis for pneumonia is really only 36% sensitive. And you see things like tachycardia, fever. You can even hear some rails sometimes with your stethoscope or do some tactile fremitus or percussion and try to find that uh, pneumonia. Now, you could turn to the chest x-ray. Um, that's uh, how we used to do it. And you could see a, a big lobar pneumonia like this one here. But a chest x-ray sensitivity is uh, anywhere from 46 to 77 percent. I mean, if you're going to miss a quarter to a third of pneumonias in a situation like this where you need to treat the patient with antibiotics, um, to me that's not an acceptable miss rate. And I'm going to look for something else in my armamentarium that helps me take care of my patient. So how good is ultrasound at finding pneumonia? Pretty darn good. Definitely better than a chest x-ray. I mean, the best that a chest x-ray the best that a chest x-ray can get is the worst that ultrasound does in a way. You could think about it that way. Um, and this is Vicki Noble, one of my favorite people in the world. She uh, works at Mass General Hospital over there on the East Coast, and she's a big super into lung ultrasound. And she's taught me a ton of lung ultrasound over the years. Uh, and so uh, whenever we go hang out, we have a great time together. Um, and she's told me that um, you know you can see these consolidations up to 95% of the time. And the other big point she makes is that these kappa values are really high with ultrasound as opposed to chest x-ray. What that means is people, uh, radiologists, point of care ultrasound people, whoever, um, when let's say you got five radiologists look at the same chest x-ray, they're more likely to disagree about whether or not there's pneumonia there. Whereas when you get five people looking at an ultrasound, they're more likely to agree that there either is or is not uh, pneumonia there. So it's always nice when you have some of the high kappa value. You know, and, um, and Vicky's always told me that whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, I've tried to explain to her that when the two of us were ended up on this mechanical bull together out in Vegas, um, it didn't necessarily stay in Vegas. It ended up on my podcast. So there you go, Vicky. <laughs> um, pulmonary consolidations, we're talking about loss of uh, aeration of the lung. When you lose the aeration of the lung, it gets uh, replaced with something else like edema or pneumonia or contusions or uh, atelectasis, means a little portion of the lung is actually not aerated or collapsed. That's what we're talking about when you talk about loss of aeration of the lung. Now, a chest x-ray can look like this, all whited out, and it could be a whole bunch of different things that cause that. But um, specifically with ultrasound, when it comes to pneumonias, what we see are hypoechoic, wedge-shaped, poorly defined, raggedy shaggedy borders to the pneumonia. In fact, we get these air bronchograms. They're very hyperechoic. I'm going to show you in a second. Super hyperechoic within that consolidated parenchyma. And as you take a deep breath, these uh, dynamic air bronchograms or lung worms increase with respirations to the extent that eventually the lung starts to look like the liver. And so how do we do this? What probe are we going to use to find these pneumonias? Boy, I'll tell you, this is the probe you're going to want to use the majority of the time. However, I've seen some pretty sick pneumonias here with this uh, curvilinear uh, probe as well. Beautiful images that thing makes. You would never use the linear probe for looking for pneumonia. This is really only going to be used in the lung for pneumothorax. All right, so what does this look like? This looks like this. It looks like the liver. We can see the patient breathing in and out. We can see these raggedy, shaggedy borders over here, some bee lines coming down, and these hyperechoic uh, uh, dynamic air bronchograms. I'll show you another example of that in a second. But you know, before I do that, I want to tell you about Jacob Avila. Jacob Avila runs this wonderful uh, site called 5minutesono.com, and uh, I heard him recently speaking on the Ultrasound Podcast, and I was just blown away at his images, and, and I reached out to him. He's a really uh, cool guy. He lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he hooked me up with these some of these images you're going to see here. He hooked us up with these images. With your, we're all going to benefit from here, so thanks to Jacob. Go check out his site. 
Um, and this is a great view here. He used the large footprint curved probe, and you saw this raggedy shaggedy border, this shred sign, sometimes people call it, and you just see this. I mean, the first time I saw this, I thought, am I looking, why does the patient have liver in their chest? Do they have like a ruptured diaphragm or something? I mean, this looks like the hepatic vein going through here and everything, but nope, this is what pneumonia looks like. It's a, when it gets consolidated like that, when it gets socked in like that, it starts to look like the liver. It's amazing. Whereas this patient over here just has A-lines. This is normal. So pneumonia, normal. Um, dynamic air bronchograms. Look at this. Uh, these images here. They look like lungworms. As the patient takes a deep breath, this air gets stuck within the bronchi, these little obstructed bronchi. And as the patient breathes in, they, they stretch out. They come out like little worms popping out of their holes uh, that you would see somewhere. So this is all the pneumonia here, this big section of lung that kind of looks like liver and you see these um, specific sign for pneumonia these lung worms and then eventually these air bronchograms they progress to a fluid bronchogram that's when a bronchus gets completely fully fluid filled and then what happens is you can start to make out the fluid inside the bronchus with the hyperechoic walls of the bronchus out here. And it looks like this when it's on, when it's a live video here. Thanks again to Jacob Avila. We can see these wonderful um, fluid filled bronchus, bronchus um, that comes out really nice uh, for, for a patient with pneumonia. Awesome shot here of pneumonia. And another example here, this is uh, again normal A lines over here. And uh, this patient over here does have pneumonia. This is a one I found when I was doing some rounds with Dr. Buteri upstairs. Uh, with the third-year medical students at UCI. You can see uh, the lung here all sort of um, looking like the liver. We can see some air bronchograms inside this lung as well. We see maybe occasionally we see a beeline or two hanging out of there. Um, but what, what's, what's this thing down here? Do you guys know what this is? See that thing moving? That's the heart. So this is a retrocardiac pneumonia, and we can see the, the aorta as well. Uh, the descending aorta adjacent to the heart as well, and this paraneumonic effusion, this fluid that's surrounding this pneumonia, this anechoic area over here. And so what's interesting is um, you can see on this case here a mixture of what I think are actually normal A-lines coming down here. I don't know if you can hallucinate them or not. Maybe the ones here. I think one could be down here. This part of the lung occasionally has some normal appearance to it. But this part of the lung is definitely like a consolidation going on over here with some B lines coming over here, maybe a little bit of a shred sign, but definitely B lines consolidation adjacent to what occasionally looks like an A line to me. This is another example of a paraneumonic effusion. We see all this fluid adjacent to the this this pneumonia with all these B lines coming out of it, this raggedy shaggedy shred sign all the way down. Here's a diaphragm coming around here with this paraneumonic effusion. And eventually these paraneumonic effusions can become into empyemas, which is where the pus really starts to gather in the chest cavity and the patient gets really toxic. So that's basically it. Um, quick uh, podcast uh, here for the lung. I want you guys to be able to identify A-lines using your phased array transducer uh, and also identify lung sliding for pneumonia, use, uh, for uh, pneumothorax using your linear transducer. And you could use the curved probe in sort of either one of these situations if you'd like uh, and see how lucky you get with it. Remember, we're going to talk about the one, two, three, four uh, quadrants of the chest times two chests. That's eight areas in which you're going to be doing ultrasound of the chest wall. The pneumothoraxes, again, are very anterior. Uh, the pneumonias tend to be more posterior. And uh, pulmonary edema tends to be all over the chest on both sides for the B lines. All right. Thank you guys very much.